السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على سید المرسلین وعلى آلہ واصحابہ اجمعین اما بعد فعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قد افلح المؤمنون الذین هم فی صلاتهم خاشعون وقال رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم مفتاح الجنة الصلاة ومفتاح الصلاة التغور او کما قال صلی اللہ تعالی علیہ وسلم ان اللہ و ملائکته یسلون على النبی یا ایوہ الذین آمنوا صلو علیہ وسلموا تسلیما اللہم صلی و سلم دائما ابدا ابدا على حبیبک خیر خلقه محمد و آلہ و اصحابی و اہل بیتہ و عطرتی و بارک و سلم تسلیما کثیرا کثیرا Respected brothers and sisters and my dearest children I would like to welcome everyone on our weekly Siratul Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam series uh, lesson number 37 MashaAllah we, we found in the previous lesson that Rasulullah Sallam has returned from the greatest miracle of his prophethood and that is Miraj, Isra and Miraj. And Alhamdulillah, he has returned with a gift from Allah Ta'ala. And that gift was in fact initially 50 times Salat, but on the advice of Musa alayhi salam on the sixth heaven, Rasulullah sallam went back to Allah Ta'ala and eventually after four or five times, the 50 times Salat became five times Salat. And Rasulullah sallam he came back with this Salat as well as this news of the great journey which he had. And unfortunately, the Kuffar and Mushrikeen, they did not believe him and they ridiculed him. But however, he was firm that he had this journey in full consciousness and he went in person and it was not a dream. And he was fully aware and conscious of whatever happened. And he described everything. How he went through the, all the heavens. Uh, until he reached the Sidratul Muntaha. And at that point he saw Jibreel والسلام, once again in his real form. And then he went further. And... He went very close to Allah Ta'ala. How close, no one knows. We don't know. And there Allah Ta'ala gave him this uh, gift of Salat, as well as these last two ayat of the Surah Baqarah from Amman al Rasul uh, to the end of Surah Baqarah. And so in the last lesson, we, we looked at the, the importance and uh, of the of this five times salat we have been given how important it is in in our life and how rewarding it is also if it is done in the proper way rasulullah sallam has described in the ahadith so many benefits of the salat however the first thing i mentioned 
that we all have to realize as the Ummah of Rasulullah and that is that we this five times Salat is compulsory upon us. It's an obligation. And while we are fulfilling this obligation, Allah Ta'ala is going to reward us also on, on top of that. Right? And then we went through the, the structure of the Salat and we mentioned three aspects that we have to make sure that we are covering each aspect of this Salat in the proper way. The first is the outside structure of the Salat. And of course, before we even enter the Salat, it is very important that we are fully park and clean and purified before we stand in front of Allah Ta'ala. And here I would like to just mention that, you know, there are uh, about seven prerequisites of Salat uh, which in fact are further before we even start the Salat. Uh, and three out of those seven, they are connected with purity and cleanliness. And in fact, the, the word cleanliness does not do justice to the word which we have park and, you know, tahara in Arabic. Uh, Paki and Tahara, uh, we cannot actually translate that as clean. It's more than cleanliness. Uh, probably uh, purity, we can say. But anyway, you know, we all understand that before we actually start the Salat, purity is very important. As the Hadith of Rasulullah, he has mentioned, he said, Miftahul Jannati Salah. The key to Jannat and paradise is Salat. This gift which Allah Ta'ala has given, we have to realize that it is actually the key to Jannat. Rasulullah described it. Miftahul Jannati Salah wa Miftahu Salati Tuhur. So the key to Jannat is now without the key, can we enter? We cannot, we need the key uh, uh, to enter any place, right? Uh, and Rasulullah Sallallahu said the key to the Salat, this five times Salat, is Taharat, cleanliness. That we are in a state of Tahara and in, in the state of purity before we stand in front of Allah Ta'ala. We have to imagine that uh, uh, I am about to start the Salat. Uh, that's why in the Hadith of Jibreel is mentioned that Anta Abu Dallah ka Anna Katara, fa illam takun tarahu fa inna hu yarag. At least imagine that if if you cannot acquire that highest level, that you are seeing Allah Taala. You know, this is the this is how we should be before we say Allahu Akbar. That our mind, our consciousness, and everything should be totally the full concentration and devotion should be towards the Creator Allah Ta'ala. I remember actually just to give an example, when I was in England a few, you know, around 25 years ago. At that time, a, a, a brother, he came to me and he said to me that so-and-so, who is a very active member in the community, has been awarded the OBE award from the Queen. Right? And this is, as we all know, uh, it is an award given by the Queen, in honor of the British Empire. Right? So uh, this award, every year there is a ceremony uh, and these people who are very active or who have done something extraordinary, they are invited by the queen and they are given this award by the queen. 
It's a piece of paper probably or certificate, right? But they, so this is something where people are very proud of. He said, uh, and he said that in order to prepare ourselves to stand in front of the queen, we have to uh, do a training of six months. There is a six month training. Uh, there will be rehearsals. How we have to stand in front of the queen. How we should walk in the palace. How we, how, where our eyes should be, where our hands should be. Yeah, right. The entire rehearsal is done before the person actually is appearing in front of the queen to receive this tiny piece of paper, this award, OB award. Right. So I thought to myself that you know, for these small things of this dunya, we we are spending months preparing for it. And subhanallah, we stand in front of Allah Ta'ala five times a day. And yet we don't prepare anything. That we, you know, we are standing in front of Allah Ta'ala, the creator. Rabbul Alameen. He is the, he is the Rabb, sustainer of all the universes. The entire creation. And as we mentioned, who, who is Allah Ta'ala? You know, he is Allah is describing him in the in the ayat al kursi. Allahu la ilaha illa hu. Who is Allah? No one is worthy of worship except Him. Allah is saying, Allahu la ilaha illa hu. And He is al Hayy, al Qayyum. He is He is forever. He is the first nothing before Him. He is the last nothing after him. He is the highest nothing above him. He is the deepest nothing below him. So this is Allah. We are about to stand in front of Allah Ta'ala. So we have to imagine. Like this person who is about to stand in front of the queen. And he is imagining that, you know, he is about to receive something great. In the same way, you know, we, we, are, we are about to stand in front of Allah Ta'ala. So before we stand, we have to make sure that we are presentable, right? And that's why, you know, uh, the body must be clean and pure. Clean means park and uh, taharat, tahir. The clothes we are wearing must be clean. And the place where we are going to pray must be clean. These three things. Miftahul Jannati Salah wa Miftahu Salati Tuhur. Three important aspects have to be taken care of before we stand in front of Allah Ta'ala. The body itself must be Tahir and uh, completely away from Najas. And then the clothes we are wearing should be Pag. And the place we are going to pray must be must be park also. And then we have to make sure that we are facing the, the right direction. This is also compulsory. We must make sure that we are praying at the right time, not putting all the prayers together in the night. They have been spread out, as I mentioned in the last lesson, for the, for the, the reason is that it is actually the body is being trained. The entire parts of the body are trained five times a day. We are pulled out from our busy schedules and then they, it is trained and then we go back into dunya so that we can use these parts of the body according to the way they have been trained in the Salah. So, it's five, so it has to be done so at the right time before the sunrise in the morning. Right? And then afternoon, right at the time when the sun is right on top of us. And then mid-afternoon, the Asar Salat. And then at the time of sunset, Maghrib. And then before sleeping, approximately one and a half, two hours after the sunset. So these 
these times have been fixed. We have to make sure that we adhere to them and also we prepare our children. You know, you know one mother, he, he, she said that, you know, uh, I try to wake up my children for the Fajr, but unfortunately, they don't wake up. You know, I've been trying very hard. So the, the scholar, he, he said that imagine that there is a fire in your house and the fire is spreading and it is about to reach the bedroom of where your children are sleeping. Are you going to wake them up a couple of times and then say, well, I can't wake them up so that I, I'll just leave them? He said that you, you're going to try your utmost and even if you have to become a little angry, you're going to do that in order to save their lives. Right? right? And this, is, this makes sense. So he said that the one Salat, if a person misses one Salat, the punishment which has been promised on that one Salat. A person will be facing in the hellfire. This is very severe. We have to imagine that when we, before the Fajr, when we are trying to wake up our children. And we have to try and create this consciousness in their mind that look, it has to, it is very important. We have to get up for Fajr. And Fajr in fact is the very important Salat. So, and we have to train our children for that very important Amal. Before sunrise, they have to get up and perform the Fajr Salat. Right? Because in reality, in one Hadith, Rasulullah has mentioned this. Right? That if a person misses one Salat, it is like everything has been snatched from him. He had, and he has been left in the middle of nowhere. In Hadith Rasulullah, that if a person misses one Salat, it is like his entire wealth and his entire family and everything has been taken away from him, snatched from him. How much sympathy we will feel for that person? If a person comes to you and says that, you know, I had a fire in my house and I lost everything. All my belongings, all my family, everything burnt away in that fire. How sad we will feel for that person. How much sympathy we will have for that person? Rasulullah is saying that the story of that person is even worse. Who has missed one Salat? That he is in a worse situation than the, 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 this person who has lost everything in, in the fire. So th that imagination and that consciousness we, we have to develop in ourselves. And that is the Amal of Salat. Right? So punctuality of the Salat is very... And before we enter, as I mentioned, you know, the body must be clean, the clothes must be clean, the place we are praying must be clean. Uh, and it, 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 we must be facing the, the Kaaba, Qibla. And we, it must be the right time Right? All these things are important. And of course, then we have to make the intention and hide all the, the parts for men in different instructions. The, the body must be covered also properly. The instructions for men are different. And in this I see, you know, Women, for example, our sisters, they are not realizing the importance. 
that the hair, for example, must be fully covered when they are praying. Salat. Very, very important. We cannot wear, wear these thin dupattas or thin scarves where the hair can be seen from it. It has to be fully covered. The satar has to be, the body has to be covered in the proper way. So I am mentioning all these aspects because, you know, there was a request uh, from a number of brothers and sisters that uh, while we are going through the, uh, the you know, sira, please give little emphasis on the, in the importance of salat. Right? Because it's very important. So then we stand in front of Allah Ta'ala. And I mentioned that one aspect is the structure. That how we have to perform the uh, the ruku, the sujood, how we have to stand. Every aspect has been described by Rasulullah. The sunnah has been given. And there are a number of important things like we which are usually taken for granted. And I would like to just emphasize like you know, standing up straight after ruku. Very, very, it is wajib in fact. It is compulsory. If you don't, your salat is void unless you do as is the sahab. Standing up straight after ruku. In fact, in a hadith, the words have been that the person stands up, Sami Allahu liman hamida, Rabbana lakal hamd, and then hamdan tayyiban kaseeran mubarakan fi. There are many words have been mentioned in the, in the hadith. And in the same way, when we are in sujood, after the first sijda, when we stand up, when we sit, sitting straight with contentment is wajib, it is important. We cannot rush. Right? This sitting straight, which is called jalsa, it is important, it is wajib. And if a person gets up and then goes back again fast, he has missed a wajib in the salah. So these things have to be taken care of. And then, in fact, throughout the salat, there is one wajib, one act which is also compulsory, which is called the tadile arkan. To do every part, every rukun of the salat with contentment, not hurriedly, not fast. You have to make sure that you're doing it slowly. You are standing in front of Allah Ta'ala. Don't rush it. Because by rushing it, we are missing the wajib. And if the wajib is missed, unless a sizda sahib is done, at the end, then your salat is void. You have to repeat it if, if you don't do the sizda sir. So, you know, we must take care of uh, the, the structure. And then I mentioned the, the second part are the wordings. You know, that the words have to be learned properly. The pronunciation has to be learned, makhraj. And then where we have to stop and where we have to pause, all these experts, the rules of the Quran have to be learned. So my advice is that Surah Fatiha and at least the last 10 Surah, if not 20, we should try and make sure we sit down and we learn properly with the meanings. And that's why, you know, I'm doing this... Uh, as I mentioned in the last lesson, I'm doing this one minute learning where we are going to go through each aspect of Salat and some of the last surahs with the meaning. So we should be making sure that we are doing this properly. And then, as, I, as Allah Ta'ala is saying, Khadaf lahal mu'minun alladheena hum fi salatihim khashi'oon. Those who are the Khashi'un, those who have the concentration and devotion, they are the ones who are successful 
who perform their salat in such a way that they are fully conscious, they are aware. Not that we say Allahu Akbar and now machine starts in our mind that I'm going to do this tomorrow and do uh, uh, my son is going to come back from school and then I have to give give him a dinner and they, all this planning is going on in the in the salat. Let's let's look into it. You know that are we actually remembering Allah Taala while we are in a salat or we are daydreaming and we our mind is somewhere else. And the reason for that is that we 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 haven't learned the meaning of the words we are reading. So we have to try and learn the words and we have to try and develop the concentration. And one way, in fact, you know, one uh, secret way, uh, one of my elders, he told me that if you want to develop uh, uh, concentration and development, uh, concentration and devotion in your salad, then there are two small things, start doing it. Very, uh, they are, they are small, but if you do it, you will see that the whole Salat will become uh, different. And that is that when we do the Ruku, in the Ruku, we, we say three times, Subhana Rabbi Al Azim. So instead of saying three times, start doing it five times. That's the secret. <laughs> Try it, inshallah. So, Subhana Rabbi Al Azim, instead of three times, five times. And then in the sujood, instead of saying Subhana Rabbi Al A'la three times, say it five times. You will see a difference in your salat. Just by changing these two things, you will see that, you know, the salat is changing. Five times with, with contentment, you are. Subhana Rabbi al Azim, Subhana Rabbi al Azim, and then Subhana Rabbi al Ala in the Sujood. So these these aspects have to be done. Anyway, this uh, this was an important aspect connected with the Miraj of the Salat, and we have to give it importance. Rasulullah Sallam he came back. In fact, Sahaba they were very very happy. To receive the salat from Rasulullah because now they can dial the number directly with Allah Ta'ala, connect with Allah Ta'ala. Anything they need, you know, like, uh, you know, one person said, uh, one scholar, he was saying that, you know, you can just dial Allah Ta'ala. We, we have the, we have the number five times a day we have to connect with Allah Ta'ala. Right? Right. So what, what is the number? Two four four three four three. That's the number. Two two fard of Fajr, then four fard of Zuhar, and four fard of Asar, and three fard of Maghrib, and then four fard of Isha, and three Wajib at the end. <laughs> right? Two four four three four three. This is a. So you can connect with Allah Taala. May Allah Taala give us the Inshallah the. So Rasulullah Sallam explained to the Sahab. And now he's, uh, he's back and he, he, as we know from uh, the previous lessons that Rasulullah Sallam is now in a situation where he doesn't have any protection and support because Abu Lahab, uh, he has become the, the leader of the Quraysh tribe and he's trying to create obstacles. In fact, not only obstacles, and uh, problems for Rasulullah Sallallahu but he is also anyone who is coming in from outside. He is misleading them and telling them that look, don't go near this person. Uh, and he and Naudubillah, he is going to brainwash you. And if you if he if you listen to him, then you end up losing the way of your forefathers. And you will leave your wife and children, everything, and everything will be lost. So they are misguiding the people. And Rasulullah now has started uh, 
to go to the the big tribes you know, and trying to explain to them about islam but as well as trying to get political asylum with them you know, because he needs this protection and support and he feels that if any of these large tribes right like you know banu kinda and banu kalb and there are many others banu hanifa and uh, they, if they accept him, then under their protection, he will be able to freely make the effort of Islam. But he's, he's making the effort at the time of Hajj, in fact, you know. And this Hajj was, even the Kuffar and Mushrikeen, that they were performing the Hajj, you know. And they used to do all the, you know, they used to wear the ihram because the routine was there. And they they would even read the talbiya labbaik allahumma labbaik labbaik la sharika laka labbaik rasulullah sallam once heard uh, these uh, non muslim mushrikeen saying the talbiya and when they reached you know labbaik la sharika laka labbaik rasulullah sallam went to them and said this is what i am trying to say to you that there is no partner with allah taala but they would then after that they would say Labbaika la sharika laka labbaik illa sharika lak. They would add, except for, for those partners which Allah has, all, Allah has created Himself. They would attach their idols and statues and say that Allah has, God has actually connected them. God has sent them to us. So they, uh, the, the, Hajj seasons, people from different tribes, they were all coming. And Rasulullah Sassam would go in Mina, he would go from with Hazrat Abu Bakr from one tent to another. And in fact, the incident which happened before, that this is not in the season, one, one of the uh, tribe leaders, and he has been mentioned as Amar bin Tufel, uh, and he's from the tribe of Dos another big tribe uh, and he came for probably business or something in Mecca. and as as he came the people of abu jahl and abu lahab they came to him to brainwash him and they say look uh, you know do whatever you want to do here you are free you can do anything but we just want to warn you that there is a person here naudu billah he's 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 a madman and, you know, they would describe Rasulullah Sassim in this way. And don't go near him, don't listen to him, and so on. So they warned him, you know, Amar bin Tufel. And Amar bin Tufel, he, he got a bit upset and frightened. And he, he decided, he said, okay, don't worry, I'm going to keep well away from him. So he started keeping away from Rasulullah Sassim. But he saw him, you know, in a, from a distance that in haram he is sitting there giving invitation and talking to the people sometime reading the quran you know and you know by looking at his face he felt uh, amar bin tufail he felt that you know this 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 face is not a face of an evil person he has so much uh, light and nur uh, and, and happiness on his face that and and you know i'm a tribe leader why should i be worried uh, how, you know i'm a tribe leader i can think properly uh, how can someone just you know by saying a few words uh, deceive me or or uh, brainwash me in such a way that i'm going to end up leaving my wife and children so that's all rubbish I don't believe in that. And, you know, I should, I should go and find out, investigate. So he came to Rasulullah Sallallahu And he sat down with him and he said, that, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Amar bin Tufail uh, and I'm from the Dos tribe. Uh, and uh, so Rasulullah Sallallahu when he heard this, he gave him the invitation. Of, when he heard the Quran and the invitation of Dawat, he immediately accepted Rasulullah. He said, these are the words of truth. 
and and he said ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammad wa ashhadu anna muhammad rasulullah i accept and he accepted and and then he spent a few days uh, learning from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi and before he was going he asked rasulullah sallallahu alaihi that what should i do rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam suggested to him that you should go back other these these people are going to give you problem and in fact when the the mushrikeen they came to him uh, when they found out that he has accepted islam when they came to him they said look be careful i am the leader of uh, the uh, those tribe and uh, if you come near me then my entire tribe will come down and you know, take the revenge so be careful and then he he went back is with the instructions from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he arrived back in his uh, tribe and there first of all his near family and friends he called them and he said look i've 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 acquired something great this in this trip and i've heard such words which i have never heard before and he told them the daawat and invitation of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and those people and he he declared in front of them that look i have accepted him if you want to accept him then you come with me otherwise i am going to leave everything and i am going to spend my the rest of my life with the, with this uh, muhammad rasulullah so when he when all the people they saw this they they also accepted and it is mentioned that within 3 4 ibn hisham has written within 3 4 days that the whole tribe qabila dos the entire tribe of dos they they became muslim mashallah and this was alhamdulillah happening uh, and then at the time of hajj when the the people were coming uh, rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would go to them and he would he would mainly concentrate on the the big tribes but at one occasion he he came across a very small group of people about i think there were about six of these people and you know um, um he uh, he talked to them and he said he asked them where are you from and they said uh, we are from the tribe of khazraj so uh, so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, he said khazraj is that the tribe uh, from yasrib who who is near these uh, uh, who live near the the yahud you know the so they said yes we are from there so these rasul asasam gave them invitation although they were only a small group of six five six people when we when they heard the words from rasul asasam they also accepted islam and mashallah you know these this is the now the foundation laying of islam reaching madina munawwara we and at that time uh it used to be called yasrib right? so let's just briefly before we in fact uh, we are nearing the time now uh, uh we look at madina which in the city of madina uh which was you know about uh, 400 kilometers from makkah uh and uh, uh it used to be called yasrib and there were three main types of people who were living there Uh, three tribes in few, if you like one were the yahud and in the yahud there were you know three uh, tribes within them uh, uh, banu quraiza and banu qunika and banu nadir uh, and then uh, in, in the uh, the mushrikeen uh, there were aws and khazraj these two big tribes there aws and khazraj so and these people who uh, rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam met they were from khazraj and compared to the uh, the yahud these people were inferior the yahud they used to consider themselves the jews uh, they were superior because they 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 were following the the religion of their uh, you know, prophets musa alaihi salatu wasalam uh, and uh, 
and they kept telling these people also that look uh, we are waiting for another prophet to come uh, and once he is here then you will see everything will be clear and we will become the leaders they would say things like this but unfortunately what happened that when rasulullah as we find it from the history that when rasulullah arrived in islam allah ta'ala gave hidayat and guidance to these os and khadraj tribe and the jews they rejected even though they were they have been waiting for the 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 new prophet to come it, because it was mentioned in torah uh, and in jeel in the bible about the uh, prophecy of rasulullah arriving right? but allah ta'ala accepted so these five six people uh, who accepted and they went back and they started working and we find that uh, in the next year when the 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 people of Khazraj, when they came from for Hajj, there were a lot more people. And out of those, around 73, you know, it's mentioned of, uh, 71 men and two women, they, they actually, uh, they accepted Islam. And they, uh, they had accepted Islam and they, they wanted to come and see Rasulullah Sallallahu And words were passed around, Rasulullah Sallallahu was going, with Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, he was well versed with the genealogy, you know, the family trees of uh, different tribes. He had a, you know, good knowledge of that. And he he would describe to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa before he would, he would introduce him. Uh, 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 and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then gave invitation and in da'wah. So these people, they they were you know all in Mina as as a, uh, for uh, Hajj and they had all gathered in Mina and in the place of Aqaba if you remember if those who have been to the Aqaba is that's the place where they they are the Jamarat you know the the stoning of the Shaitan uh, so uh, a secret meeting with Rasulullah Sallam was decided right on at the end of the Hajj, you know, probably around the uh, 13th of Zilhijjah, right? So, uh, and this is the time when everyone is very tired and ready to go back. So no one would know that something like this is happening. And they decided this place near Aqaba and Rasulullah Sassim took all the precautions. Uh, and they met them and, and then these 72 uh 71 men and two women uh, you know they took bath and they with the rasulullah sallam they accepted him and inshallah you know this is, time is up now we will uh, continue on this uh, that how now allah ta'ala is accepting uh yasrib which eventually is going to become the madina although it is not in the mind of rasulullah sallam Rasulullah Sassam is looking at probably he, you know, in his in his plan it was that maybe you know like Yemen or uh, or other uh, different uh, big cities or places where the tribes are there. Uh, if they accept me, uh, then we can set up the foundation there. But he never had the, in his mind that it will be uh, you know the Yasrib or Medina. But Allah Taala had his own plans allah ta'ala you know uh, decided that inshallah uh, islam is going to be taken by this small group of people and then allah ta'ala is going to make this uh, yasrib uh, the place of rasulullah sallallahu inshallah how it unfolded we we are going to inshallah mention in the next uh, next lesson next week inshallah may allah ta'ala give us the ability uh, to uh, be punctual in our five times salat and enable us to prepare and work on our, our five times salat so that we can perform it uh, in a proper way with full concentration and devotion. Wahiru Dawan and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Suman la yu bihamdi, Sumanak Allahumma, wa bihamdi ka nashadu Allah ilah illa anta, Nastafuru ka wana tuwi lake, Nastafuru ka wana tuwi lake, Nastafuru ka wana tuwi lake.
سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم